It's the tribulation will be twelve suffering. Great suffering. There was great suffering in Sodom when the people were plagued. But none were to compare with the suffering that will be going on like Jesus said in Matthew 24, 22. At the time would be such as the world never had seen nor ever would see again. If this truth got a hold of us, how bad the great tribulation is going to be, we'd be out knocking on doors, on, even on our hands and knees, begging people to flee from the wrath to come. I want you to know, brother, the tribulation, there's going to be a time in Revelation 9 where there's going to locusts come out as prepared unto battle out of the bottomless pit. They'll have crowns of gold. They'll have face like men. They'll have hair like women. They'll have teeth like lion. Hello, twisted sister. How'd you get in there? They'll, they'll, they'll have all kinds of things. They'll be making their noise. Their noise will be like unto horses prepared to battle. And brother, the Bible tells us the water's going to turn to blood. Ninety-five pound hailstones will fall out of the air. Men will be scorched with fire, not be able to commit suicide, and death shall flee from them. The tribulation is going to be the most terrible time that the world has ever heard, or heard of or seen. Now, all Christians have tribulation, but tonight I'm talking about the tribulation, the last three and a half years, seven years long, the last three and a half years of which is called in the Bible the Great Tribulation such as the world never had been or ever will see again. The word tribulation comes from a little uh, uh, a stick, like a little club that people used years ago called a tribulum. And a tribulum was to take and beat the wheat. And we'd bring the wheat in there on the, on the threshing floor. They'd take that tribulum and beat it and beat it and knock off the... Uh, the uh, the unwanted uh, part of the grain and, and the, uh, what's the word there? Dr uh, chaff, yeah, the chaff off of the wheat and beat it into what it ought to be and be pure. Now that's where the word tribulation comes from. When I first got saved, I'm, I'm trying to hurry, I've got a lot to get to. When I first got saved, I was sitting in a training union class at Nebo Baptist Church and they began to talk about the rapture. And they begin to talk about Jesus coming at any moment and Christians going through the ceiling. And they talked about us going out of here in our body, a molecule in our body, body agreeing with the molecules in the roof and all this stuff, and us disappearing. I thought, my, what in the world? I'd never heard that in my life. I always thought that things would get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then one day the Lord just come back in the sky and blow everything up and, and, and He put some on one hand, some on the other, and some go to hell and some go to heaven, that'd be it. I, I never heard of the rapture going out before uh, the wrath of God fell on this earth. Matter of fact, I didn't know anything about the wrath of God. I didn't understand it. And so I began to wonder about that. And I've always been the type of person that I don't care who tells me anything, I want to be able to find it in my Bible. And brother, I want to be able to check it out with the book. And if it don't check out, don't matter who says it, I, ain't, I don't want to fool with it, do you? And so I began to read my Bible, and I couldn't find it. I didn't understand the verses that y'all were throwing at me a while ago. And I began to, I said, where does it say that we're going raptured out before the tribulation? And so I got a preacher down. And I said, preacher, where does the Bible say that we're going to be raptured out? And uh, he gave me some verses here and there, but it didn't satisfy me. I, I just couldn't see it in the, in the Bible. And I began to wonder. And that's when I began to ask around. And the other told me that we was in the tribulation. And some told me this and some told me that. And, and I read really begin to wonder. Now, as I said a moment ago, we ought to be preparing for tribulation, but uh, I don't believe we should be preparing for the tribulation. That we, there's some of us in here, we may go through famine. We may go through a war. There's no telling what we may see before Jesus comes back. That's persecution of the devil. I'm preaching tonight, will the church go through the wrath of God? Now, I want to give you seven reasons tonight why I believe the church will not go through the great tribulation, that the Lord will rapture us out, and the word rapture simply means caught up and taken off, snatched, translated from one place to another, why we will be gone when the tribulation comes. Not just protected from it, gone gone in the clouds to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Number one, the first reason I want to give you tonight why I don't believe the church will go through the tribulation and you need to get all of this and get it down so you can present it when you ever need to. Number one, because of the types of the Bible. 
the types of the Word of God. When I studied types in the Bible, I found out that the types of the Bible support the doctrine that the church will be taken out uh, of before the tribulation. The types in the Old Testament teach future events. And that's the Old Testament is a live book when you realize that the events in the Old Testament are bound to happen again. The Old Testament will repeat itself. And the events in the Old Testament take place again, such as Moses, Moses and Elijah and all those type of things. The coming out of Egypt's bondage and going into Canaan land, that type of thing. All right, let me give you some Bible types while I believe the church will go through the tribulation. Now in the book here, this, this fellow mentioned that, that the church would go through the tribulation. And he used for an example, Noah, I believe it was. Didn't he say Noah? That one of them, he said Noah. Now, his, his reasoning is this. God told Noah, he said, Noah, I'm going to pour out my wrath on the earth. Noah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drown the world with water. And he said, Noah, here's what you do. You build a boat, you get in the boat. And the guy's reason it is, even though the water didn't hit Noah, God never raptured Noah up in the sky. Noah went through the flood, protected by the ark. And the guy's saying is, if God let Noah go through the flood, he's going to let me and you go through the tribulation. And a lot of people swallow that and say, yep, that's right. That sounds good. Noah's a picture of the Christian. But they're forgetting one little detail. And it's a mighty important detail. And Brother James hit it right on the nail just a while ago. They're forgetting about somebody who lived in the chapter before the flood, or chapter before God called Noah out, by the name of Enoch. And they forgot all about him. This little book I've got here, don't even mention Brother Enoch. It tells nothing about him for the Bible said there's a man that brother that walked with God and it was before the flood and the Bible said that man was name was Enoch and he was a seventh from Adam and brother that's God's number of completion and that old boy was a seventh from Adam and he walked with God he walked with God he walked with God now y'all listen to me real carefully did you know most of your major denominations matter of fact just about every denomination uh, historically and doctrinally does not teach that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. About any major denomination you can think of. Their seminaries don't believe this, what I'm saying to you. You don't believe it? Call it and ask them. And so Enoch walked with God. And he walked with God. And he walked with God. And the Bible said he was not. He disappeared. He, he just vanished in the thin air. And he walked with God before the flood hit. Noah is a picture of the tribulation Jews preserved through the tribulation. Enoch is a picture of the church raptured out before the tribulation. I'm here to say, listen, you can't, you can't give me no other explanation for Enoch being in there. You can't give another explanation of where Enoch fits in Bible prophecy and in type. And oh, Enoch's the same one that prophesied over in Jude. The old Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints and all of that dealing with the revelation. Now, I believe that because of the types of the Bible. God did not remove his people my foot. God removed Enoch, brother. He removed him. You say, where'd he go? He went to be with God. He didn't even die. Enoch never died and never will die. Some people said Enoch's got to come back and die. No, he don't. He ain't going to die. You know why? Because he is a picture of the Christians who are alive at the rapture who go to heaven and never do die. You say Hebrews 9.27? I don't know what Hebrews 9.27 says. Hebrews 9.27 is not a doctrinal statement. Hebrews 9.27 is a, is a general statement that everybody dies and everybody faces judgment except those that God raptures out. Yeah. That's right, brother. That's right. Because of Bible types. Let me give you about old Joseph. Old Joseph in the Word of God. Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ. Listen carefully. I'm going to move fast. Uh, I'm going to move very fast, so listen carefully. Joseph in the Word of God was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was rejected by his brethren. Just as Jesus Christ came to the Jews, he came to his own. His own received him not. And so, the Lord turned to the Gentile. Now, what Joseph did when he was rejected by his brethren, he was taken down there to Egypt and exalted the right hand of the king. Now, you know what happened? Joseph married a Gentile bride during the time of rejection by his brethren, a picture of the Jews. 
and before the seven years famine on the earth. The seven years famine of which Joseph was over the corn when the good years were up, you know, and, and he, had, he had the corn, and then when the bad years come, Joseph had all the corn. He married a Gentile bride before those seven years famine, picturing Christ being rejected by the Jews, going back to heaven, calling out a Gentile bride, and being married to her and, and calling her out before the seven years tribulation. Not only that, excuse me, not only that, Moses was rejected by his brethren. They said, who made you a ruler or a judge over us? His brethren rejected him. He went off to a far country. He married a Gentile bride before the plagues hit Egypt, which is a type of the Great Tribulation. When he came back, the water turned to blood, and the frogs and the lice and all that stuff happened. You know what old Moses was doing? He had done went and got him a Gentile bride and came back and had the, had the battle out with Pharaoh. That was a picture of the great tribulation of the book of Revelation. Not only that, John, the apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation. Now we're ready to go to the book. Turn to Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. And I want to give you something here about the apostle John. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, is going to show us something here in the Word of God. Revelation chapter number 2. And I want you to notice here. Somebody brought it up here a while ago. I believe it was Brother Ricky. In Revelation chapter 2, all you see is church in 1, 2, and 3. Church, 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 church. The word church or churches is mentioned 19 times in Revelation chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. That's all you hear about in 1, 2, and 3 is church, churches, church, churches, church, churches, church, churches. But from Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 on to the last of the book, the church is not mentioned. That's the wrath of God from chapter 4 to chapter 19, verse 11. You'll not find the word church from Revelation 4, 1 to Revelation 19, 11. It's gone. Nineteen times in three chapters, none from chapter 4, verse 1 on. You say, Brother Danny, that might be coincidence. I ain't through. In Revelation 1, 2, and 3, the Holy Spirit is in the midst of the churches. The seven golden candlesticks which are the seven churches. And the, and the Holy Spirit is in the midst of them. From Revelation chapter 4, the Holy Spirit is up in heaven around the throne. Are you hearing me? The Holy Spirit's in the midst of the churches. And 1, 2, and 3, it's up around the throne from chapter 4, verse 1 on. I'm not through. In Revelation chapter 4, there's a door open. Look at it. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. After this. After what? After him mentioning church 19 times. After this, I looked, John said, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, but two times in the book of Revelation, a door is open. One time, somebody goes zip and goes right through it. The next time, somebody comes out of it in 1911. Doors open, the Lord comes down, the armies of heaven following him. Two times the doors open. Chapter 4, verse 1, a door was open. John says, and the first voice, you remember 1 Thessalonians about the rapture? He said, there will be a sound of a voice of the Lord. And the first voice I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. You remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? He said, and the voice of the Lord and the trump of God. You've got a voice, you've got a trumpet. They're there. Now notice. He said here, in verse number 1, what did it say? Come up hither. And I'll show you things which must be hereafter. That's the tribulation. The word come up hither is in the Bible three times. Here, and in chapter 11, and back in the book of Proverbs. Every time you find that phrase, come up hither, Somebody goes right up out of the, in the sky and goes to heaven. The two witnesses that somebody mentioned a while ago, they heard the voice come up hither and ascended up in the cloud. 
John here turns out to be a type of the church. John said, as soon as he heard that voice saying, come up hither, verse 2, and immediately I was in the Spirit. He wasn't in the Spirit like we say, Oh, glory to God, I got it in the Spirit. A Christian's always in the Spirit. In that sense, the Holy Spirit's in you, you're in the Spirit. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwell in you. John wasn't talking about that kind of in the Spirit. He's talking about transformed, translated, and his body's changed because he said he's sitting there looking at the throne in heaven. Now let's look at old John here a minute. Did you know that John is a type of the church? Did you know the Bible said that John the, uh, John the Revelator here was the disciple whom Jesus loved? You ever notice that reading the book of John? The disciple whom Jesus loved? Now does that mean Jesus didn't love the other disciples? No. Jesus had a special love for John. The Bible said God so loved the what? The world. But then He said He loved the church and gave himself for it. When it says he loved the church and gave, does that mean he don't love the rest of the world? No. But he had a special love for the church. He loved all the disciples, but a special love for John. You know what the name John means? It means beloved. You know where John was laying at the Last Supper? Right here on the Lord's heart. You know where the church came from? When they pierced his side, just like God laid Adam down in the book of Genesis and opened up his side and took out a bride, when Christ was pierced his side, there came out blood and water and bought the church and John's head was laying right on the Lord's breast. John the Beloved. Somebody is arguing with the Lord one time and said, what shall this man do? And the Lord said, no, right there, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And boy, they went around and said, Jesus said, John wasn't going to die till he seen it to his coming of the Lord. Yet Jesus said, Not of them he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And John did tarry till he saw the coming of the Lord. He saw it on the Isle of Patmos in the vision and wrote it down in the book of Revelation. Bible types. Bible types, brother, teach us the church pictured by John the, uh, the Revelator will be caught out before the Lord comes. Number two, are you listening? I don't look like I've lost some of it, but I'm, I'm just going to have to go ahead. Maybe the Lord will help you to get up with us a little bit. Number two, because I don't believe the church will go through the tribulation, because the tribulation is a Jewish time. God deals with the Jews during the tribulation. The Bible calls the tribulation Jacob's trouble. You know who Jacob is? He's, his name means Israel. And he's the father of the Jewish nation, the twelve tribes of Israel, and the tribulation is absolutely a separate, a Jewish time. Okay, here we go to the chart. Turn to the book of Daniel. I want to show you something here. Now the reason I couldn't understand Matthew 24 and the reason most people still can't understand it is because they never see the difference. We're in Daniel chapter 9 now. Most people never see the difference between Jew, Gentile, and church. There's three different groups that God talks to in the Bible. Jew, Gentile, church. What He said to the Jew, He did not say to the church. What he said to the church, he did not say to the Jew. What he said to the nations, Gentile, he did not say to Jew or Gentile. What he said, or I'm sorry, or church. The church is made up of saved Jews and Gentiles. Matter of fact, most people who began the church in Acts chapter 2 were, were Jews. Then Gentiles got in. But God, since the Jews rejected the message and rejected the Messiah, the apostles said, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And God took out a people, or He is taking out a people, for His name. But in the tribulation, it will be a Jewish time. God will go back to dealing with the Jews. Now we're going to do some Bible study. Daniel chapter 9. 
Daniel chapter 9, we have the prophetic teaching of 70 weeks. Now, you know what this fellow's problem is that wrote this book? He don't understand Daniel's 70 weeks. You don't know what the people's problem is who, who believe the church is going through half of it? All they do is study Revelation and leave out Daniel. If all you did was study Revelation and leave off Daniel, you could come up with the theory that the church is going through half of the tribulation and as Brother Ed calls that, that's a ruptured rapture. Which are the church got it going halfway and then going out before the last three and a half years. Now, let's look at what the Bible calls the 70 weeks in the book of Daniel. Look at it with me, if you will. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully. It'll get boring if you don't listen carefully. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I come to show thee. For thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Here we go. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Who is Daniel's people? Who? Seventy weeks are determined on thy people and upon thy holy city. Who's Daniel's holy city? Jerusalem. To do what? To finish the transgression. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. Who's that? The Lord Jesus. Alright? Stop right there and hold your place. Watch it. Watch it. The Lord told Daniel. He said, Daniel... I'm going to give you 70 weeks. 70 weeks from now until everlasting righteousness comes in. 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined upon the Jews. And God said when them 70 weeks is over, everlasting righteousness is going to be here. End of sins is going to be here. Reconciliation for iniquity is going to be here. 70 weeks. Alright, all we got to do is figure out when the 70 weeks started and when it ended. Here we go. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, there's the beginning, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, capital P, shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. How many is that? Sixty-nine. How many is seven and three score and two? Three score and two, sixty-two. Seven, sixty-two and seven is what? Sixty-nine. Sixty-nine weeks from the going forth of the commandment until the Messiah comes. What he was saying was this. He said, Daniel, there from the time the commandment is given to build Jerusalem until the Messiah comes is 69 weeks. Seven and three score and two. Seven and three score and two. Sixty-nine. Now, he said this. Let's find out when the commandment was given. Hold your place in Daniel. Turn back to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter number 2. And we'll see here in the Word of God when the commandment was given. That book of Nehemiah is right after Ezra. It's before Job. So if you see Job, go back to the left a little bit and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2 and look somewhere around in there. At verse 2, chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter number 2 and verse number 1. And it came to pass the month Nisan, that ended Dotson. In the twentieth year of our tax Xerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? 
This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Then said, and said the king, Let the king, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, Jerusalem, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, and thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. And the king gave a commandment to build Jerusalem. Now back to Daniel. The Lord said, from that time right there, which was around B.C. 445, to the Messiah would be 69 weeks. Now, it was 483 years. So we got to figure out in the Bible, in prophecy, what does a week mean? A lot of times in the Bible, he'll say a week or an hour, and it'll represent a certain amount of time. Now, you want me to show you what a week means? Turn back to the book of Genesis. Hold your place in Daniel. We're going back to Genesis. And in Genesis, I want the story there. Somebody help me find it. I've not got it marked, I don't think. Of where that, um, what's his name? Jacob worked for his wife. All right, Genesis 29. Genesis 29, Jacob worked for his wife. And the Bible said that old Laban was going to let him marry his daughter. But he said, you ain't marrying my daughter unless you'll work seven years for her. Seven years you're going to work for my daughter. If you're going to marry her, you're going to work seven years. All right, you know the story. He worked seven long years, and then lo and behold, Laban who did him? Slept the wrong girl in there, and he married the wrong one. And then he said, you gave me the wrong one. I want the other. Rachel, I believe it was. And guess what Laban told him? He made him work another seven years, but notice what he called it. Genesis 29, what now? Where are we at? Okay. Look at verse number 25. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this that thou hast done? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Served him seven years. Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. He said, You want to give, marry this other? Fulfill her week. And we'll give you also this service. And he had to work another seven years. Verse, Which thou shalt serve me yet, me yet seven other years. Everybody looking at it? Look in verse 28. He said it seven years. Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So what's a week? Seven years. Every day represents one year. Now, if one week represents seven years, what does 69 weeks represent? 483. If one week represents seven years, what does 70 weeks represent? 490. 483 plus 7. Are y'all listening to me? Listen. Listen to me. I want to tell you something. We're getting ready to shout. Look at here, brother. He said, from the commandment to everlasting righteousness was 490 years. 483 of them happened before Jesus came. You know how many that leaves? Seven Jewish years. Are y'all listening? 483 out of them 490 happened before Jesus even got here. And God gave them Jews 483 years. They got seven more. Alright, we ain't through yet. Daniel chapter 9. You never will get the rapture of the church right. Do you understand Daniel 9? Daniel chapter 9. Okay. Notice here. Verse 25. Know therefore 
and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, where's that? Right here. To the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. See that little mark right there I got? Seven weeks and 62 weeks. 69 weeks, 483 years, Messiah, the Prince. Now watch my finger and watch your Bible at the same time. One eye up here, one eye on the book. Watch it. The street shall be built again and the wall in troublous times. And after the three score and two weeks, these 62 right here, after that seven, shall what? Messiah be cut off. Died on the cross. But not for himself. Who's it for? Us. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He said, after this, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for... That's for me, brother. That's for me. Now look. You see something in there between himself and Ann? You might see me and you in there. Look real hard between himself and Ann. See them two little bitty dots? That's us. That's right. There's a church right there. The church wasn't revealed to Daniel. He skips right over the church age and goes to the tribulation. You know how I know? What's the next part of the verse? And the people of the what? Little P. That ain't the Messiah. I had a preacher one time sit right there where Brother Mike said he's trying his best to get me messed up as he was. And he's trying to say that as the Lord Jesus. And I said, hey, wait a minute here, buddy. He just got cut off right there. What do you mean? What's he doing there in the next part of the verse? Little p. The prince that shall come shall destroy the city. What city? Jerusalem. You ever wonder what Jesus meant when he said, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, head out of town? Spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet. That's Matthew 24. The people of the prince, that's Antichrist armies, shall come destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end. He that shall endure unto the what? And the end. Thereof shall be with a flood. There's that flood where the devil trusts if he can take up Jordan in his mouth. There's that flood, that latter rain. And the sun comes up in the millennium as clear shining after the rain. And unto the end of the war, battle of Armageddon, desolations are determined. Watch it. Watch it real carefully. Verse 27, And he, who's the he? Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for what? One week. How's, what's that? Seven years. He's going to confirm the covenant with the Jews for seven years. The first thing the Antichrist is going to do when he comes to make a covenant with the Jews. But look what happens. And in the midst of the week, what's that? Middle of the tribulation. Three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He's going to quit letting them sacrifice. He's going to quit letting them bring offerings to the temple. He's going to say, now you're going to worship me. And Second Thessalonians said, He that showeth, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, and so that he is worshipped. And he's going to cause them to have a mark. And them Jews are going to say, hey, whoa, no doing here. God told us in the Old Testament not to take no march. And he said, well, I'm going to get you Jews. I never did like in no way. And then the Lord said, when you see the abomination that maketh desolate, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let him that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, abomination and desolation, bottom of 27. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Abomination, desolation. The abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist breaks his covenant in the middle of the week, goes in, sits down on the throne, and says, I'm God, you worship me. Now, what did Daniel see? Daniel saw this. Let me write, give you some other scriptures that tell you what a week is. won't take time. Ezekiel 4, 5, and 6, and Numbers 14, 34. One day represents a year. That's Ezekiel 4, 5 and 6. Also, Numbers 14, 34. You say, Brother Danny, where, where'd you get that stuff? Let me tell you something, brother. The stuff I'm giving you here tonight was preached and put out by Clarence Larkin in 1910. Amen. Amen, brother. This ain't something somebody just come up with last year. Amen. Amen. That's right, brother. You say, well, I ain't never heard it. Yeah, it ain't my fault. Been around since 1910. 
Schofield preached it. Clarence Larkin preached it. The other Bible preacher. Somebody said, well, I ain't never heard that before. Well, get your eye off that boob tube and get in the boob. All right. That's what the Bible means when it said a time and times and a half a time. Three and a half years. Now there's one thing about old Daniel. Old Daniel was a prophet. And he looked out like this and he saw everlasting righteousness. 490 years. 483 of them, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And then the people of the prince that shall come, Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he'll break the covenant. And he'll cause the overspreading of abomination to make it desolate. And then Daniel saw everlasting righteousness come in. There's one thing that was hid from Daniel. Them Old Testament prophets looked. And they looked and they, they wanted to see it. And they, they peeped in and desired, angels desired, and prophets have inquired diligently. And you know what it was? That's what he didn't see. He seen right over top of it. And you know what he said? He said everlasting righteousness is coming in 490 years and 483 of them has done go. There ain't but seven left. And God looks down and he says, my soul, 483 years done gone. There ain't but seven more. I believe I'll do something before I have that last. I believe I'll do a new thing. It's kept secret since in the beginning of the world. I believe I'll do something I ain't never heard of before. I believe that before this last seven years, I'll just stick in one big going out of business sale. Whosoever will, they can come and bring the word of life freely. And the Lord Jesus said, Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God done something them Old Testament prophets never thought of. Never dreamed of. Turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter number 3. And look at verse number. He couldn't believe, they couldn't believe them Gentiles got in and made up a body. Them Jews couldn't figure that out. They were blinded. You know how long they're blinded according to Romans 11? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And then God will go to dealing with the Jews again. They'll have that last week. It'll be over. But now it's whosoever will. Come get it. The blue light special, brother. I mean, come whosoever will. Call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Get in before that last seven years. God gave them 483 right before that last seven. Stuck in 2,000 years of grace. Look at here. Ephesians 3. Verse number 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand. My knowledge in the mystery. When you see that word mystery, boy, of Christ. Verse 5. Which in other ages, Old Testament, was not made known unto the sons of men. is hid from them. They didn't know it was there. As it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is it, preacher? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Partakers of the promise of Christ by the gospel. God said it's a mystery that's been hid since the beginning of time. Church, the body of Christ. I believe that the church will not go through the tribulation because God's time clock stops when the Jews are out of fellowship with Him. And God determined that everlasting righteousness would come in 490 years. That's for, uh, 70 weeks of 7 years each. And God turned the clock off when the Jews rejected the Messiah to call out a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the church goes out, God will turn the Jewish time clock back in, have the seven last years, and then everlasting righteousness will come in here at the millennium. Now, let's go here. Got to move. Number three. I believe, and I'm going to keep referring to this, that the church will be raptured out before the tribulation. Number three, because much of the church is already at home. Now, 
The people who teach the church will go through the tribulation teach that it will go through it to purify it. They say, we got to be purified. You ever heard that? Anybody ever try to say, well, we got to be purified. God's going to let us go through the tribulation and get to sin in our lives and purify it. Hey, man, probably 80% of the church is already gone. How come we're the only ones that have to get purified? That don't sound right. I believe the church will all be taken home before the tribulation because much of it's already at home. You think the Lord's going to put part of His body through the tribulation, rest of His body being up there? Amen. Read 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Philippians 1.21. Got to move. Number four. I believe that the church will be raptured out before the tribulation because of the Scriptures dealing with the second coming. In other words, the Bible teaches that the second coming of Christ is in two parts. One secret, one public. This man in the book said, he said that's ridiculous. He said if you teach Christ comes here in the rapture and then here in the revelation, you're teaching a second and a third coming of Jesus. He's wrong. The Bible don't say Jesus comes a third time. It teaches His second coming is in two parts. One secret, one public. Now if you'll listen... The first coming was in two parts. One secret, the other public. He appeared in Bethlehem's manger at night. Only to a few believers. And they're the only ones that even knew He was here. He didn't come with trumpets blowing and power and glory. He just appeared to a few ones that believed in Him at night. Then you don't hear nothing else about Him. Pick Him up when He was 12. Then 30 years old, He came out and made it public. That's two parts of the first coming. If the second first comes in two parts, the second comes in two parts. The first part secret in the clouds. The th- second part, every eye shall see him. Did you ever have a problem with them verses? Man, I used to read that and it'd say, I'll come as a thief in the night. He's going to get us out of here. Then I'd read, every eye shall see him. Power and glory. Lightning shine from the east and west. I'd say, thief in the night. Lightning from the east to the west. Them don't work. They don't coincide. They're saying two different things. First part of the first coming was secret. Second part of the first coming was public. The first part of the second coming is secret. The second part of the second coming is public. The scripture says, Thief in the night. Another one says, Every eye shall see him. The wrath, as the brother Dale mentioned a while ago, and Brother Roy Lee mentioned. Let me give you the two verses Romans 5 9. If the tribulation is wrath of God, and that's what it's called in the Bible, we are saved from wrath through His blood, as Brother Dickie mentioned. That they're easy to remember. They're both 5 9. Romans 5 9, 1 Thessalonians 5 9. There's two promises. Notice where I'm getting my scripture. I'm not getting it out of Matthew 24, dealing with Jews. I ain't getting it out of Ezekiel. I ain't getting it out of Daniel. I'm getting it out of 1 Thessalonians and Romans. That's Gentile, brother. That's church age doctrine. And it said, We are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by Him. We'll be taken out because of the Scriptures that deal with the second coming. In the Bible, in Jude chapter 14, the Bible talks about Him coming with ten thousands of His saints. And every eye seeing it. But the Word of God said in John 14, 3, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. The Bible talks about him coming for his saints. The Bible talks about him coming with his saints. The second coming is uh, in two parts, and we're going out before the tribulation because of the scriptures that deal with it. Let me give you one more, and we'll move on to the next point. Luke chapter 12. Turn your Bible to Luke chapter 12. Let me give you a verse that deals with the Jews. Now, let me tell you again, you'll never understand the Bible. You get that distinction between Jew and Gentile. Luke chapter number 12. The Bible said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's three raptures. There's one here when the saints come out of the graves and went back to heaven with Jesus. Proverbs. There's one here when the Christians go out to meet the Lord. Revelation chapter 4. There's one here when the tribulation saints go to meet the Lord and go in with Him to the marriage supper. I believe, it's hard to figure out, but I believe He's up here in heaven with us. Here's the judgment seat of Christ taking place through the tribulation. Right before the marriage... 
the Lord comes down this way. Watch it. The Lord comes down this way. And behold, there was a cry made at midnight. The bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to what? Meet him, not marry him. Meet him. The ten virgins. Now that makes good preaching. And I like to hear preachers preach on the ten virgins and five being left with the rapture. That ain't what that scripture is talking about. Before the marriage. They go up to meet him. We get married. And they that were ready went into the marriage. Then he comes down, and notice what he finds in verse chapter Luke chapter twelve. Them old boys run out of oil, and look what he told them. Look at uh, Luke twelve thirty five. Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. They had to go buy them some oil. Verse thirty six. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding. You see it? Everybody see that? He's returning from the wedding. He's already married when he comes down. He's already married when he comes down here. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage. They that didn't have no oil were like unto men keeping their lamps burning when the Lord shall return from the wedding. They get to go to the feast. Turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. I got you thinking now. You're quieting down on me. There'll be some messed up. Won't know where you're coming or going by tomorrow. I'm doing that on purpose. Get you to think. Matthew 22. Parable. Verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king. Who's that? God. God the Father. That made a marriage for his son. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Sent forth his servant to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. He sent forth other servants. All things are now ready. Here we go. Look at it. All things are now ready. Come to the marriage. Matthew 25. The five virgins that were ready. They made light of it. One to his farm. Another to his merchandise. Remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. King heard he was wroth, sent forth his armies. Look out! And destroyed their murderers and burned up their city. What's their city? And verse 8, Then saith he to his servant, The wedding is ready. Now if the wedding is ready, the bride and groom evidently are there. And the rings are there. And you know who's going to perform the ceremony? God the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to step out. And you know what we're going to be doing while the tribulation is going on? Getting the wrinkles ironed out of our wedding garments. And then we're going to come down and say, Here comes the bride. And that's what Revelation means when it said, His wife hath made herself ready. We've been getting the wrinkles ironed out of our garments. Boy, here we come down through there. And the preacher steps up. God the Father. And he said, the wedding is ready. Go out on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Look. Verse 9. Go in the highways and hedges and bid. Many Jews will find bid to the marriage. So his servants went out on the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with a bride. If you ain't reading, you didn't know if I was reading that or not. Right? And the wedding was furnished with a bride? That ain't what it says, is it? What does it say? Yes. The bride's done standing there ready to get married. The wedding was furnished with yes. The people who are saved during the tribulation, are you listening? The people who are saved during the tribulation are not part of the bride. They're yes. The bride leaves here. Now, I just hit on something else that's going to blow fur when this gets on radio, and I hope it does. If the church started here and ends here, those Old Testament folks ain't working a part of the church. And they wasn't. They're yes. You know what God's going to give them Jews? The earth. The meat shall inherit the earth. That's what he told them in Matthew 5. Boy, some of y'all sitting there looking at me like, I don't know. You go check out everything I'm saying with this book and then tell me it's wrong. I'll guarantee you that's what that book says. 
Brother, where'd we get to here? Matthew 22? Uh-oh. Guy tried to sneak in there and get in without a wedding garment. All these... Well, anyway, the wedding was furnished with guests. Why don't you see that? Look back at John, the book of John. Notice what John the Baptist said. Now, now you're learning something tonight. You're learning something about dispensation. You're learning that the Old Testament saints were not a part of the church, the body. Now, the Bible said in the book of Acts that they were the church in the wilderness. That's Acts chapter 7, verse 38. They were a part of a church because a church means ecclesia, a called out assembly, but they were not a part of the body of Christ because Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. The church hadn't even started yet before Christ died. You can't show me nowhere in this Bible where it said the church started before Christ died on the cross. Ain't in there. No way. Now notice what old John the Baptist said. John knew he wasn't in the bride. Sure the world. John knew it. John knew it. John knew it. Well, I got to hear some of it. John 3. John 3. Verse 28. They thought he was the Christ. And he said, you're wrong. Verse 28. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. Verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which doth what? Standeth and heareth him. Rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know what John said he was? Friend of the bridegroom. Best man. Best man. Here's God the Father. Here's the church. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, whosoever will, come to the marriage. The wedding's furnished with guests. And the Lord God's going to say, The ring, please. John the Baptist. We'll reach in here and he'll pull out one sun as shiny as a locust. Wild honey. And give it to the Lord Jesus. He standeth by and heareth the bridegroom's voice. And say this, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Boy, old John the Baptist is going to hand the ring. The Lord's going to put it on our finger. We will be married. And then we'll turn around, brother, have that marriage supper come back in power and glory. You know what you do when you get married? You don't go home right then. You go on a honeymoon. You know what you do right here? We're going on a 1,000-year honeymoon. That ain't our home. That's a 1,000 years is finished. John said, Behold, I saw a city coming down from God out of heaven. That's our mansion. Brother there, we're going to move in after the honeymoon's over. Move into our brand new house. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm here to tell you that's what the book said. You say, I don't believe that. Well, this is for believers. That's all one can shout. Is one that believe it. You don't believe it, you can't enjoy it. You know what? You know what some people's problem is? They try to figure everything out. You know what, the rejoicing day, when I just said, bless God, that's what it says, I'm going to shout about it and rejoice. I'm going to quit trying to figure it out. I'm just going to believe it. Yeah. Let the book say what it says. Yeah. Well, I believe church is going out for the tribulation. Yeah. Where in the world was I on? Number five, because of the judgment seat of Christ? Well, I wasn't even on that, was I? Lord, I went three or four there. Oh. Now, there's a lot of differences, opinion, on when the church started, but I believe it started Pentecost. And if that's true, the Old Testament saints wasn't in it. You can't apply God's promises to Israel to the church, or vice versa. The wedding's going to have ushers, flower girls, guests, maids of honor, all kind of stuff. The church is a virgin. Israel is the backslid wife of Jehovah. You can't confound the two. Israel's going through the tribulation because she's backslidden out of fellowship with her husband. Matter of fact, he temporarily put her away for running around on him. That's what the Old Testament says. Now, the church is the bride of Christ, a virgin who 
in faith is faithful to the Lord and will be taken out before the tribulation. Okay, I'm going to have to hurry. The fifth one was because of the judgment seat of Christ. Christians are judged in the sky. Matthew 25, that judgment's on the earth. At judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you've got a modern version of the Bible, you don't have a judgment seat of Christ. I guess you plan on going to the white throne. But the, the new Bible don't say judgment seat of Christ. There's enough reason right there to get rid of them. We're going to the judgment seat of Christ. Number, number six, because the church is the bride, his body. I've done preached on that. I'll, I'll, I'll go on. Yeah, number six is because the church is the bride of Christ, his body. He's not going to torture his own body. Number seven and last, because Antichrist cannot come until the church is gone. The Bible said there, remember in Daniel, but not for himself. Did it? Two little dots. That's us. Two thousand years. And two little dots represent a thousand years feet, I reckon. And there we are in the church age. And then, and the people of the prince that shall come. The Antichrist. We're bringing it to a close. Second Thessalonians 2. Brother Clinton done preached my sermon a while ago. Matter of fact, y'all fellas hit on every one of these. I just wanted to make it enforce it a little. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Verse number 3 is talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse number 4 is talking about sitting in the temple of God. Daniel, 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation. Verse number 6 said, And you know what? With beholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. And he cried. Verse number 7 said, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it. What does the word let mean? Hinder. You can define it from... Uh, I got it marked in another Bible. Somewhere back in Isaiah or somewhere where it defines the word let. You got it? Isaiah 43. It tells you what the word let means. It means stop. Only he who now letteth will let, he'll hinder, until he be taken out of the way. Now, as I said a while ago, the Bible don't say that's the Holy Ghost. But let me ask you this. If it's not, who in the world could it be? I believe it is. It don't say it is, but who else is stopping the mystery of iniquity? Sure ain't me. And ain't nobody else I know. And it ain't no preacher, and I know of. Who is down here in this world that's stopping the mystery of iniquity? The Holy Ghost. And when he's taken out of the way, the man of sin will be revealed. Clearly showing us that the church is going out. The Antichrist comes in. God turns the clock on. The last seven years, the last week of Daniel 70 takes place and everlasting righteousness comes in. Let's buy our heads. You know what Rebecca done? You know what Isaac done before Rebecca got there? He went out to meditate in the field. He come down to meet her. And she looked up and said, Who in the world is that? And the servant said, There he is. She jumped off the camel and ran to meet him. And he turned right around and went back to his mother's tent. And she became his wife. 